So in the last lesson, we spoke about um, box and whisker plots. And we also spoke about when we drew them, we needed to find something called the five number summary. And then towards the end of the lesson, we, we had drawn a couple of box and whisker plots. We started to talk about how we can describe the distribution of the data or the shape of the data. And we use this word called skewness. And so I just want to start with a little kind of a little bit of explanation. So if your box and whisker plot looks like this, where the top 50% is about the same size as the bottom 50%, we say the data is symmetrical, okay? Um, and so the median and the mean are pretty close together if in this sort of situation. If we have a data set where the lower 50% looks quite squished up and the top 50% looks spread out, we then say that the data is positively skewed or skewed to the right. And if we have the opposite where the top 50% is quite squished up, but the bottom 50% is quite spread out, then we say the data is negatively skewed or skewed left. So often they have interpretation questions. And so I want you to be aware of that. Give me a thumbs up if you feel like you can interpret a box and whisker plot. Now, before I move on, I want to ask you another question. I want to ask you, how much of the data is sitting between here and here on this particular box and whisker plot? How much data is in that interval that I've drawn a squiggly line over? Oh, sneaky, sneaky. I have, oh, I love it when I ask a good question. So, bomb, bomb, bomb. It's not 50%. It is 25%. Because the box and whisker plot has a minimum value there, Q1 there, Q2 here, Q3 there, and the max over here. And so this is 25% of the data. This is so the lowest 25% of the data is between Q1 and the minimum. That's why it's called the first quartile. The next 25% is here. The next 25% is there. And the, the last 25% or the, the highest 25% is up here. 50% of the data would have had to cover an area like that big. Because that is the middle 50% of the data, or this is the interquartile range. It's Q3 minus Q1. Okay, so that was me being sneaky. Let's, let me ask a couple more questions to check that you aren't with me. How much of the data is sitting between this point and this point? When you look at my big squiggly green line, how much of the data is sitting in that space. Okay, so this is from Q1 upwards, right? So from the first quartile, there are there is 25% of the data is below, and 75% of the data is going to be above Q1. Yeah. Because remember, what is the point of quartiles? Quartiles are dividing up the data into sets. Um, and in the last question, how much of the data is sitting in this space? How much of the data is sitting in that space? Indeed, that is 50%. And that's the whole point of the median, right? It's halfway through the data, the top 50%. And then here is the bottom 50%. Okay, cool. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Tell me about this box and whisker plot. Is it skewed to the left or is it skewed to the right or is it symmetrical?
Okay, so indeed this data set is skewed to the left because the bottom 50% is definitely more spread out than the top. Um, if I say to you, what is the interquartile range? Could you do that for me? What is the interquartile range of this box and whisker that you see in front of you? You could also say negatively skewed as well. So skewed to the left or negatively skewed. What is my interquartile range going to be? Or basically the space in which the middle 50% of the data is sitting. So Q3 is 33. Q1 is 27. And so the interquartile range should be 6. Yeah. So the middle 50% of the data sits um, between six units. Okay, so that looks okay to me. Uh, let's have a look at this question. This is a past exam question, actually. So it says here, the five number summary of heights of trees three months after they were planted is the following. So this is like in the last lesson, we were talking about the five number summary. And this is the five number summary. And it is describing heights of trees three months after they were planted. Now, if you look at 42, you can kind of see the 42 is down here, 50 is the median, and 53 is Q3 here. Um, let's do this one first. Determine the interquartile range from this question. Okay, so it looks to me like 53 minus 42, which is 11. So that's good. What percentage of plants have a height in, this meant to be in, not a. Uh, so what percentage of plants have a height in excess of 53 centimeters? So what percentage of plants have a height above 53 centimeters? So think about the box and whisker and think about how you connect that. So I see 53 is in line with there, and that is Q3, which means that all the data above that is just going to be 25%. Okay, so this should be 25%. Okay, last question for this one. Between which quartiles do the heights of the trees have the least variation? So between which two quartiles do the heights of the trees have the least variation? What do we think? So remember the quartiles, we're almost looking variation, which ones are the least spread out, right? So which ones are the most squished? And there is a big, the whiskers are far too big. It's just a question of if it's that one or that one. And I think it's that one. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is, what quartiles are involved? And I think that is Q2 and that is Q3. And so between Q2 and Q3 is, that's the area with the least variation. Okay, cool. So I think, we're getting better at interpreting. Um, so with the percentage question, aren't we supposed to say 75 minus? Oh, okay. Not quite important because we know the 53 they gave us, um, the 53 that they gave us is the directly linked to the box and whisker and it's in line with Q3. So the moment we know Q3, Q3 is 75% of the way through the data, but it's a great question, Impul. But in this case, no, it is correct the way it is. Okay, now something else I wanna to touch on tonight, I'm gonna to do grouped data in the second half of the lesson, but I just wanna to quickly touch on something called an outlier. Now, and how, could you identify an outlier? So when we talk about an outlier, or I'll quote the notes here, 
An outlier is an observation that lies an abnormal distance from other values in the set of data. Outliers will skew data sets. They affect the, the shape of the data. And so sometimes in some calculations, we have to leave them out. And the definition for an outlier is something which is one and a half times the interquartile range less than Q1. So let me write that down in a way that maybe makes more sense. You can find a value of Q1. And then if you go below that, you go below it one and a half times the interquartile range. If something is below that, it's considered an outlier. But there's also a limit on the upper side. So if you go to Q3 and you add one and a half times the interquartile range and have a value bigger than that, that would be an outlier. Okay, so now in order to figure out if something is an outlier, you clearly need to know what Q1 and Q3 are, which we did in previous lessons. So I want you to tell me if you think there are any outliers in this data set. So the data is ranked from smallest to biggest. Do you think there are any outliers? And maybe I could even ask you, where do you start? What's your first thing? I think we should find Q1 and Q3. And we also need to find the interquartile range. We need to find Q1, we need to find Q3, and then we also need to find the interquartile range so we can figure out the lower bound and the upper bound. So tell me the answers you get for Q1 and Q3 in the chat, and tell me the answer you get for IQR. So Nompilo, it might be one, but let's have a look. I still need to do some working out before I can confidently say. Um, so how many items? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. It's 11 items. So. So for Q1, I get 12. And I use the third position, one, two, three, so that's 12. For the ninth position, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's nine, so that's 19. What is my interquartile range going to be? So that's going to be seven. So now I need to figure out what my lower bound is and what my upper bound is. So I'm going to go Q1 is 12, and I'm going to take away one and a half times by seven. The 12, so that's the Q1 minus. What do I get for my, I'm going to call this the lower bound. If it's below this, it, it's an outlier. So what value do you get for the lower bound? So I'm being told that the lower bound is one and a half. Now, what about the upper bound? The upper bound is going to be 12 plus 1.5 times 7. And I am hoping that you guys can help me with your calculators and tell me what is the upper bound. Okay, so it's going to be 22.5. All right, so now the question is, are there items that are below 1.5 and above 22.5? If there are, they're outliers. So are there any outliers in my data set? For Zama, yes, absolutely. So for Zama, one is below one and a half. So the first outlier is one. 
Are there any other ones? 32, you're absolutely right, because it's above 22 and a half. Are there any other ones? Are there any other outliers? Lomelo, there are 26 as an outlier as well. Why did I use 12 and not 19 as the upper bound? Um, Buzo Siwe, when I work out the upper bound, I went 12. Oh, goodness, guys, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. Can you see my mistake? Buzo Siwe has spotted it. So if you look at this, this should be Q3. So if you look over here, you are going to actually, instead of having a 12, you should have a 19. That was me making a bit of a boo-boo there. So can we get a new upper bound? Thank you so much, Buzo Siwe. You caught that right where it was happening. So 19 plus 1.5 times 7, what do we get as our new upper bound? We get 29.5. So now the 26 is no longer going to be classified as an outlier. The only outliers we have are 1 and 32. Okay, so if you have to work out whether something is an outlier or not, the formula, um, these lower and upper bounds are, are the thing that's going to help you. Okay. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you followed that. Give me a thumbs down if you feel it confused by the idea of determining if something is an outlier. Okay. Awesome. So if you are unsure, don't just re-watch this part of the video. You'll see that you just basically calculating Q1, Q3, and, I, and the intercooler range. So you get those three values, and then you're just applying this formula to get a lower bound, and then for, you're applying this formula to get an upper bound. Okay? And if something's above the upper bound, it's an outlier. If something's below the lower bound, it's an outlier. Okay. We'll come back and do another one in this, in this unit. Um, but I think what I want to do today is I do want to get onto the grouped data stuff. So let me go to um, a grouped data table to start with, because today's topic is group data. So if I look at this table, how is this situation different to the stats that we've done so far? What is different about this? data presentation. What is different about this data presentation? Yeah, so instead of being a list of items, they are intervals. So there's a situation here, which I'll go into in a moment, but there's a, between 0 and 10, between 10 and 20, between 20 and 30, it's no longer an exact value. And then I have a count how many times you fall into that interval. And so this is called grouped data. And learning how to work with grouped data is kind of going to be the focus for the rest of the lesson. So when we talk about the middle of the data or central tendency, we spoke about this in lesson one, and we spoke about finding the mean, the median, and the mode. But now when we deal with grouped data, we, we can sort of find these things, but we can't find them in exactly the same way. So I'm going to ask you to ans answer this question first. You are going to try and find me the mode or the modal interval for this data set. So let's just understand what the data set is even saying. A choir teacher kept records of a number of learners who attended 40 choir practices during the year. And so there are 40 data points. There was one practice where there was between 0 and 10. There were two practices where there were between 10 and 20, 11 between 20 and 30. Which of these intervals is going to be the modal interval? Okay. 
Now, which of these intervals is going to be a modal interval? Well, as I look at the screen now, I see that you guys are saying between 40 and 50, and you're absolutely correct. Because the mode is the one that occurs the most often. So spot on, you guys are winning at life. The correct answer is the modal interval is between 40 and 50. Yeah, Marang, they are, <laughs> some students are fastest finger first candidates. So now we have our modal interval. Now the median, the median interval is probably a little bit more tricky. What do we do when we found the median before? We found the position of the median first, and then we found the median. But here the median is going to have to be an interval. But I can still calculate the position of my median. What's the position of my median going to be in this particular data set? I suppose I need n. What's n going to be? So n is 40. Yeah. So calculate the position of my median. Calculate the position of my median. So the median position is a half times n plus one, which is a half times 40 plus one, which is 20.5. Okay, so it's the 20.5 or it's just over 20. How are we gonna find the position of the median? Well, we know we need to go 20 items in, just over 20 items. Now, at this point, you've got one item. At this point, you are three items into the data. Which interval do you think will contain the median? Ah, cumulative frequency. Aha. Uh -huh. So you guys are saying if we add a cumulative frequency column, maybe it will be easier to see when we get that far in the data. So let's do that. One, three, 14. 23, 37, 40. So if I look for, I'm one, then I'm three items in, then I'm 14 items in. Now I'm 23, I've gone, I've gone too far. So it has to be, it's not here. It must be in that interval. And so the interval that has, is gonna be between 30 and 40. And so we're going to say the median interval is between 30 and 40. Give me a thumbs up if you're okay with that. Give me a thumbs down if you're a bit unsure. Okay. Now, the last one is a bit more tricky because I need a mean, but in this data set, the mean we don't have actual items. We only have um, intervals. And so we need some sort of, we know that there's one data item here. We know that there's two items in this range, but we need an estimate because normally with the mean, you divide by the number of items, which is 40, okay? There's 40 items. But now for this next bit, you're gonna have to add up all the items and we don't even know what the items are. So what we do is we find the midpoint of the interval, and we use that as our estimate. But now what's tricky here is that we must remember what the interval is saying, and we must also think about what type of data we're dealing with. So I want to go back to lesson one's topic and go, is this discrete or is this continuous data? The number of learners at acquired practice, is that discrete or is that continuous? Okay, it's discrete, which means that it can only take on whole number values. And we know that the number X has to be greater than zero. So the very first whole number that occurs in the interval is going to be one. And the very last number that occurs in the interval is going to be 10. Because it says less than or equal to. So if we think of that interval, first number that's valid is one, the last number that's valid is 10. If we go to the next interval, 
The first number that's valid is going to be 11. The last number that's going to be valid is 20. Because we're basically finding the first and last numbers that can fit in here. So if I want to find the midpoint between 1 and 10, I'm going to say 1 plus 10 divided by 2, and I'm going to get 5.5. The midpoint for the second interval is going to be 11 plus 20 divided by 2, and that is going to be 15.5. What do you think is going to be the next midpoint that we're going to use as an estimate for an item of the, in the next thing? I think it's going to be 25.5. And then it's going to be 35.5. And then it's going to be 45.5. And then it's going to be 55.5. And so after the break, because we're going to take a break now, we are going to estimate the mean for this group data set. And the values we're going to use as estimates for each interval is going to be the midpoint of those intervals. But we have been working. Yes, Tobocho. Uh, let's unmute Tobocho. Hi, sir. Hi, how's it going? Good. Um, for the midpoint, why can't we say zero plus 10 divided by two? Okay, the reason we can't do that, and it, it is, I, I suppose some teachers might say, oh, we're being petty, but the reason is the X value has to be greater than zero, okay? So if you look at the way the table is constructed, do you agree that X must be greater than zero? Yes. Now, the problem is, because we're dealing with discrete data, it's um, the number of learners that acquire practice. You can't have 0 0.5 learners attending acquired practice. You can either have one or you can have two. And zero is being excluded because we haven't, you know, X has to be greater than zero. So we're basically looking at the first and last values that are valid. Now, we'll do an example after the break where it's continuous data, where we can include right up to zero, but it's basically because it's discrete data. Does that help? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great, Great question. All right. Let us um, do a bit of exercise first because we've been going for half an hour and I want everyone to have a chance for your brains to recuperate. Uh, and so, yeah, join me by standing up and let's just swing our arms because you've done quality half an hour of maths. And for that, your brain deserves to be treated with a bit of TLC. Let's roll our shoulders. And let's roll them forward. Okay. And then let's rotate a little bit. Oh, I can hear clicks from my hips. Start off slowly and then just start rotating more and more around. And you'll see that your body starts to go further naturally. Oh, it's quite relaxing. Okay, then uh, let us do, what should we do? Uh, let's do this one. We'll do that. Stretch across like this. And then go to the opposite shoulder like this. And then just shake your arms out one more time. Take a nice deep breath. And then take one more. Okay. And then let's just do uh, a little bit of uh, skipping. So we're going to do 20 virtual skips and we start in three two, one, let's go. And there we go. I hope that your body is feeling like it's had a bit of a break. And I do have a little brain teaser for you. So uh, today's challenge is based around flags. Can you tell me what one Japanese and two Americans equal to? That's what I want to know. 
Tell me what you think. Who has some ideas? I feel like we know how much an American is worth quite quickly because this must be a three, otherwise it wouldn't work. And that's a three and that's a three. I think this is the Russian flag and that would be a four, but there's two of them. So each of them must be two. So what is my final answer going to be? Japanese flag, level I agree, is 12. So what is my final answer going to be? It is 3 plus 3 is 6. And 6 plus 12 is going to be 18. Yep. Um, and so apparently people from 18 countries have visited the space station, although I suspect that may have changed since this was put together, but that is today's brain break. Okay, cool. I hope that you enjoyed that little puzzle. So for this next part, we're going to have to get our calculators out. So please go and get your calculators if you haven't already. I'm going to put my calculator up on the screen so that you can see it, hopefully. Um, and let me bring this thing back. For a look. And that is that. OK. So here's the thing. In order to do this estimated um, mean calculation, we, we don't need the cumulative frequency column, but we do need estimates for the values because we, we don't know exactly where in the interval it goes. And we have to turn on the frequency column for, um, <laughs> uh, don't worry, Nkateko, we'll, you can definitely watch the recording. Now, to turn the frequency column on is a little bit complicated. So I wanna make sure you, you follow, it's not complicated, but it's a bit weird. So what you do is you go shift, set up and you get the screen which has nothing on it that can help you but if you click down you get to a new menu which has a stat button there so i'm going to do it again so that you can all join me i go to get to turn the frequency column on you go shift set up i've got two maybe i should even write this down as i go so i went shift then i went set up and then i have to go down arrow so down arrow then i'm going to hit the button for three which is stat on my calculator and then i'm going to turn i'm going to hit the one for frequency on give me a thumbs up if you have done that bit that you've turned your frequency column on. Okay, now we have to enter the data to estimate the mean. So what we're gonna do is we are going to go uh, mode. So this is the second set of instructions. So we're gonna go mode, and then we're gonna go two for stat, and then we are gonna go one, for var, and we get that, um, we turn the frequency column on. Now I have to put my data in. The data that I'm choosing to represent the items in this interval is 5.5, and I'm actually just going to do all of the, the data points first and come back for the frequency. Maybe five. Okay, now I'm not done because I still need to change these frequency counts. There isn't just, well, there's one item in the first interval, but there's two items in the second interval. So I go two equals 
11 equals 9 equals 14 equals 3 equals. At this point, I've inputted my data set with an estimate value for each item in the interval, and I've also recorded how many times it occurs. Now, I still haven't got my estimated mean yet. I need one more set of instructions. Just want to do a quick check-in. Give me a thumbs down if I'm leaving you behind. Give me a thumbs up if you're following what I'm doing here. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is hit AC. So I hit AC. And I go shift one. So AC. Oh, why does it keep doing that? Shift one. And then I go to four for var. So four. And then I hit two for the median and I'm going to hit equals and I get 36. Put 36 in your in the chat if you got 36 on your calculator. If you got something different, put that something different. And this is what we call an estimated mean calculation. So we estimate that the mean is 36 from this grouped data table. So the estimated mean is 36. Now, if we didn't use our calculator to help us with that, the only other way we could have got to that answer would have been to say one times 5.5 plus two times 15.5. So I'm basically just working through here uh, plus, I would have had to carry on. I would have had to keep adding up stuff. Plus, uh, 11 times 25.5. And you will eventually get the right answer if you do all the intervals. But using your calculator would be a lot quicker. And so that's why I wanted to show that to you. Now, I can repeat the calculator process. So um, should we do it on, um, I wonder if I have another data set here. Um, if I have another data set. Um, should we do another example, Anarko, and we can, we can do it together in that process. So let's do another one. I want to show you a scenario that's a bit different. Okay. Now, in this situation, we are dealing with a grouped data table, uh, it says it was found that 90 of the foundation phase learners were accompanied to school by someone. The ages of the person accompanying the child were recorded as shown in the table below. So the person, the age of the person accompanying the child to school, there were 12 people who were between 0 and 10. There were 30 people between 10 and 20. Now, if we talk about age, is age a continuous or discrete variable? So the time, the number of the age and years, this is going to be, okay, you're probably going to debate me on this, but it, I'm going to say this is a continuous variable, okay? And so because the time or the age is continuous variable, I'm going to say that we can go, even though we can't include zero, we could go 0, 0,0001 years, and so when we work out the midpoint, when we work out the midpoint in this situation, we can go, what is halfway between zero and 10? Oh, there's some audio. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Cool. Um, so what we're gonna do in this scenario is when we find the midpoint, because it's continuous, you can continue right up until the end point. And so zero plus 10, halfway between is going to be five. Halfway between here and here is going to be 15. Um, halfway between here and here is 25. 35, halfway between here and here is 45. 55, halfway between here and here is 65. So 
I just want to make that difference. If it's continuous, you can use the endpoints. If it's discrete, you have to go to the last discrete value that's involved. Now, if I want to estimate the mean with this data set, it's the second question here to estimate the mean. We're going to do that first. I'm going to use my calculator again, and I want you to do it with me. So I'm going to go to turn the, if you've already turned the frequency column on, it should be there, but I'm going to do it again just in case. So shift mode. No, wait, shift set up. And then you get the screen. Okay, then you go down arrow. Then you click stat. And after you've clicked stat, you get frequency on. And you hit one, and then you'll get that. I'll just go and grab the instructions I wrote down so that you guys can have that with you. Um, let me just grab this quickly. Um, so I'll put the instructions at the bottom here. So shift setup three, one. Then I go mode two, one. And I want everyone now to put the data in where the midpoint is five. This is going to be 15. This is going to be 25. So it's going to be 35, 45, 55, 65 equals. And then the frequency is going to be 12, 30, 30. I want to see if you can get the last step by yourself and then tell me what your estimated mean is for this particular data set. So I'm going to get AC to clear it. Then I go shift one, four, two. And I get an estimated mean, an estimated mean of 25.667. Or six, seven, if I was rounding it off. So that would be the answer to question B for this um, grouped data question. Okay, now I actually didn't ask you to do A and C yet. So let's do that. What is the modal interval for this grouped data set? What is the modal interval for this grouped data set? So think about what are you scanning for when you want to get the mode modal data interval. So the modal one is the biggest count, the one with the most in it, which is here. And so the modal interval should be that one. It's going to be when X is between 10 and 20. Okay, what about the median interval for this particular data set? What is the median interval? I know last time we did an extra column to help us. So that's not a bad idea to have a cumulative frequency column. And so if you're unsure about how I'm doing it, then do ask a question. I'm pretty sure yeah, it added up to 90. It should always add up to, to that because that was what they said at the beginning. What is the median interval? What is the median interval? Can you remember how we did that earlier in the lesson? Bongo Corsi, um, so the estimated median, no, so we, we only do the estimated mean 
as an exact value. For the other two with grouped data, we have the median interval and we have the um, modal interval. So to find the median interval, we have to do a bit of a calculation, a position calculation, which is a half times n plus one. And that's 90 plus one. So that is position 45.5. And now I've got to say, how, what interval am I lying in when I get to the 45th position? So that's not enough. That's not enough. Oh, I've gone too far. So it feels like the median interval is between 20 and 30. Yeah. So I don't think group data is too bad. It's just adapting some of the ideas that we did in lesson one to the context of data in a group. And really, it's calculator skills and finding the midpoints um, for particular intervals. Now, let me, we're going to use something called a ogive or a cumulative frequency curve to help us estimate um, the, the median. So that's coming up in lesson um, six. We'll talk about how we estimate the median. Okay, we use something called an ogive or a cumulative frequency curve. How much marks do stats count for in the exams? Different schools do it slightly differently, but I think, you know, in the exam, I actually have the breakdown. Maybe cast the beginning of the next lesson, just remind me. I think it's about 30 marks out of 150. So about 20% of paper two off the top of my head. That's what I would, would say. Okay, before we finish off today, I just want to do an example of a chart that we get for grouped data, and that's called a histogram. And so what we have in a histogram is we have intervals along the bottom. So we can see here the first interval is between 30 and 40, and the next interval is between 40 and 50. And the, the count is the number of days. So often with a histogram, you would have an F, but it is possible to have number of days because the situation is, is basically describing a story. It is, Jim measured the temperature at 2 p.m. at the same spot in his garden and recorded the results to the nearest degree for each day of the year. And they're using the Fahrenheit scale, which is a different scale. The results are shown in the histogram. So it, because it's a whole year, there's only going to be 365 possible items. And so you can see over here, this looks a little bit more than, whereas, you know, um, this is sort of, I would call this the modal modal interval because it's occurred the most often. So here's your question. On approximately how many days was the 2 p.m. temperature above 70 degrees Fahrenheit? So if you look at this, can you see the data that was in a table is now in a graph? And can you answer this question by reading the information from the graph? Because the data is grouped into, into intervals now. And then answer the option A, B, C, or D. I guess I should probably find 70 first term. So there's 70 degrees, and it has to be greater than 70. How between 70 and 80, how many days were between 70 and 80? What is the scale here? That's 30. And that's, so if that's 30, over there, I'm guessing that's about 25. Over there, it's about 25. But then what about the days when it's between 80 and 90? There, it's also... And that looks to me like it's about 10. So what's the closest one to that? Now I'm, I'm approximating, but it's definitely not that or that or that. And so approximately 39 days 
the temperature was above 70 because it's, it's this interval and it's also that interval over there, which is B. Okay, and so in the next, um, being able to read data from a histogram is an important part of grouped data because often grouped data is displayed in a histogram. And all a histogram really is, is the intervals along the bottom with no gaps, so no gaps at all. And then the frequency or the, the count on the um, vertical axis. Okay. Um, let me... Uh, oh, let me do one more question about histograms. Here's another histogram. If I said to you, is this data, I'm going to actually ask you a sneak, like an interesting question to enter. Is this data skewed to the left or skewed to the right? What do you guys think? Is this, his, this is a histogram of, um, of marks and then the number of learners is on the left. Um, Okay, so keep those answers coming. There's some good debate going on here. I want to suggest that this little squiggly thing will help you. Now, I suppose the only way to know for sure would be to go to the median, but it looks to me like there are two items here, four items here. Um, there are four here, six here. How many items? There's 11 here, 10. Here we have seven, and here we have four. So if we look at where the where is the median interval for this thing? Where is the median interval for this data set? Well, the total number of items is 2, 4, so that's 10, 16, 27, 37, 44, 48. Okay. So where is halfway through the data? Uh, so the position of Q2 is going to be a half times uh, 48 plus one. So this is gonna be 24.5. But let's see if we can find the median interval. It's 10, 16, okay. So I think we have found the median interval, which is over here. Can you see the data to the left? Of the median interval is more spread out than the data to the right. What does it mean if the data to the left is more spread out about the skewness? Is it skewed to the left or is it skewed to the right? What do we think? Yeah, it's skewed to the left or negatively skewed. So just to finish off tonight, I've showed you how you can use the thinking about skewness from Box and Whisker. You can also apply it to um, histograms, which are grouped data tables. Okay. Everyone, we have squeezed a lot into tonight's lesson. You've done very well. I see that um, Kia Betzwe has put the link to the uh, quiz in the chat. And so I want to wish you well for the rest of the week. I look forward to... Um, your quiz results and doing some shout outs um, for the quiz next week. And we'll continue with our last week on um, stats next week. And we'll do, we're going to focus on grouped data and ogives and frequency polygons and these types of things. Clomela, what was your question? Let me, before we finish off tonight. So I just want to ask um, for outliers, in what context would we use quadrant three to calculate the outlier? Oh, not quadrant three, it's quartile three. Sorry, quartile yes. Quadrant, three. Yes, sir. Um, um, in what uh, what context would we use that instead of okay. one? What would it look like? So the question um, I can give you to show you kind of how it's used from an exam question. We didn't have time to do it tonight. But like, um, 
For example, here's an exam question, and all it says is determine whether 10 is an outlier. Now, to be honest, you're not going to use the upper bound for this one because it's 10 is, is on the low side. But if they'd said you determine if, if 100 was an outlier, then you would have to work out the upper bound and then go from there. And then see if there's any number above 100 or something. Or, or if 100 is above the upper bound. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you, sir.